Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Austin Bingham. I work for and part own 60 North, a uh, small software development and consulting company based in um, Oslo and Stavanger, where I'm from, Norway. Uh, there was quite a Norwegian contingent, actually, from what I could tell. Are there any Norwegians here in the room or non-Norwegians living in Norway? OK, great, great, cool. Where you, uh, Oslo? Yeah. OK, great. Um, Today, I'm going to talk about the, well, the primacy of testability, you can read that. Um, basically, I want to look at the importance, the, the usefulness, the utility of testability in a software architect's role in their job is something that I think is maybe a bit overlooked, but it could be much more highly leveraged in, in a number of ways. And so we'll kind of look into that and try to gain some, some insight, hopefully, or hopefully I can share some what I think of what I think of as insight. Great. Before we get into testability, though, I want to talk a bit about the weather. Um, the Earth's atmosphere is composed of something like a million, trillion, 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 trillion molecules, um, you can give or take. Um, on the order of 78% of that is, is molecular nitrogen, about 21% of that is molecular oxygen, and the rest is other stuff. Left to, the, left to their own devices, these molecules really wouldn't do a whole lot. They might just sit around. But the sun is constantly pumping something like 89 petawatts of power into the atmosphere. And because there's uneven cooling, uneven heating, because there's things like clouds, and because the Earth changes its you know, angle of attack to the sun as it rotates, revolves around the sun, you get all sorts of motion. That motion is what we call weather, um, fully 50% of the Earth's atmosphere lies within about five kilometers of the surface of the Earth. And that means that we are intimately involved with it. We're intimately involved with it when we fly planes. And that's where the clouds are, and that's where the rain comes from. So all the stuff that happens in the atmosphere, of course, is which is what we call weather. It's uh, rain, winds, floods, hail, all of that kind of stuff. And this is the part of the atmosphere that we're most concerned with. This is the level of abstraction we're concerned about. The weather, we're not so much concerned about the molecules themselves. Some people maybe are. But for the most part, we want to know, do I need an umbrella or can I wear shorts to work today? We expend a great deal of energy uh, trying to understand and predict the weather. We have you know, satellites that are looking at all sorts of things on the Earth, just the shape of clouds, uh, reflectance, um, motion, uh, temperature of the ocean, and that's just from space. We've also got radar on the ground. That's a you know, Doppler radar. Everybody's heard that word. Um, Sending, using microwaves to track the, the motion of, of, of liquids, the motion of the, the water in the atmosphere. And all this information is fed into you know, huge computers and is processed by sometimes you know, government agencies, big government agencies whose job it is to you know, put smart people to work, writing algorithms to figure out, again, is it going to rain tomorrow or can I wear my shorts or maybe take the day off because the weather's really nice. That's how it is in, in Norway a lot. You, you decide, well, the weather's really good. Good, I'm going to stay home and take the day off. So like I said, that's a lot of energy, a lot of mechanism, a lot of complexity that goes into trying to predict the weather. And we do a pretty good job of it, especially you know, one or two day forecasts are really reliable. There are tools at the other end of the complexity spectrum, though, that are really, really useful. This is a picture of a barometer. A barometer does nothing more than tell you what the pressure of the air above you is. Uh, barometers can take a number of different forms. One form is the, you know, the, the typical column of mercury, and that's actually how we get the measure of, of air pressure in a lot of cases, uh, millimeters of mercury. Other versions of barometers are sealed box, you know, sort of fancy aneroid barometers with a big steel spring in the middle and gauges and stuff like that. But ultimately, they're very simple devices compared to the satellites and radars and computers. And with a barometer, you know, a piece of paper and a pencil and time, you can do a really good job of predicting the important parts of the weather, the parts that you kind of care about. I know that if the barometer tells me the pressure is high and it's rising, chances are really good that I'm going to have nice weather. Or if the barometer is telling me that pressure is falling, it's probably going to rain. And if it's low already and it's, already, and it's still falling, I'm probably going to have a storm. And so I've taken a simple tool, something that almost anybody can approach, and something I could monitor very easily. And it, help, it tells me a lot of what this other complex stuff is doing. And that's a bit of the, the metaphor 
uh, that I'm going for in this talk. Testability is a barometer for software architects. I want to kind of push that metaphor maybe a bit too far, but it's a good starting point. Um, I'm originally from, from Texas, where the weather kind of comes in two modes. There's um, boring, normal weather, which is kind of hot and dry, and then there's terrifying weather, which is tornadoes and, and hurricanes. That, that's really, that's what you get. Um, having moved to Norway a number of years ago, though, and I've gained a deeper, maybe more subtle appreciation for gradations of weather and for things like seasons and for things like, uh, <laughs> yeah, having darkness in the winter and, and, light in the, uh, and, and light in the summer, things like that. And so these kind of weather metaphors come to my mind uh, a bit easily, and so uh, forgive me if I, if I push this a bit too far, but... Um, Testability as a barometer for software architects. Um, as architects, as software architects, our job is, is hard. And, and that, that goes for really anybody to, in, in software development. It's just a difficult thing to do. It's one of the things that's, I think, at the limits of sort of human cognitive ability right now. Our ability to manage and develop software is just, it, it's, pushed, it's pushing us farther than, than most other engineering disciplines, if you can even call us an engineering discipline. Um, a big part of our job, in, in, in my mind at least, is to um, manage and to foster and shepherd and you know, design, lay out things like um, non-functional requirements, uh, these software qualities or um, what some people might call architectural drivers. I see that as a, a core part of our job. Um, you may be doing that in your role at, at your work. You may not call yourself an architect. Your business card may say something else. Um, whether you call yourself an architect or not, this talk is aimed at you. If you are responsible for looking after, or, or just feel personally responsible for looking after the non-functional requirements in your systems and your projects, then hopefully what I'm talking about here will um, apply very directly to what you do. Consider for a second what makes the job so difficult. Um, in many organizations, the software architect is dealing with multiple projects at a time. Uh, you have one guy who's been given the, the title architect and he has to kind of flit around to the different projects and say, yes, you're doing a good job, or uh, you know, there's a problem here and we're going to kind of re-architect this a bit. When you're working on multiple projects, it's hard to keep everything in your head at once. Um, and it's hard to sort of flush the cash from one project as you move into the next one and fill it back up. So there's a great deal of mental load there. Another issue. Uh, of course, you may just have very large projects or projects, what I call fast projects, that are moving and evolving very rapidly. And keeping track of um, the, 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 the architectural drivers in projects that are moving particularly fast is really difficult because what you thought last week you know, doesn't apply so much this week. Or the decisions you made last week have to be rethought and you can have to do this over and over and over. And of course, you may be doing large, fast projects. You may be doing multiple large, fast projects to make things even worse. More insidious than that, in, to my mind, are the complex interactions between the various qualities that you are trying to monitor. Uh, you can make a decision, uh, an architectural decision, to, uh, in, that you think is going to improve scalability. That's going to give you, you know, higher scalability for your, whatever your project happens to be. And you can subtly and silently damage, say, the extensibility or the security of your system. And it's the, the silently part that is bad. Because I, I, I can consciously choose to erode one, one quality in favor of another for, for business goals. That's, that's an important part of the job. But if I don't know that's happening, I'm damaging my project in ways that I don't understand and can't account for. And that's, um, that leads to a lot of problems that we have in software development, not knowing the ramifications of the decisions we make. Ultimately, all this amounts to mental overload. We, there's just too much for us to keep track of. If, if I try to come in every day, as an architect, and I, I have my checklist on it. Is extensibility okay? Is, is scalability okay? Is performance okay? Blah, 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 blah. There's just no way to do it in, in, a, in a practical sense in most environments, most development environments. And so you end up with, this, does this series of pictures make sense to most people? If you played Doom, okay, good. So this is, this is the almost dead space marine who needs a, a med kit. Um, so maybe testability is that med kit. So I want to propose that Testability is, again, a key factor, a key quality we can use to help us understand and keep tabs on and monitor a lot of these other illities, a lot of the architectural drivers. Um, you know, if I understand the testability of my project, does that tell me something about modularity? 
or tell me something about the scalability of my project, or does it help me maintain the usability of my project? Um, I'm going to argue yes. That's a, I'm going to give away the, the thesis here, but yes, I think we can, and I want to kind of explore some of the ways to do that. Um, this is important. It's, it's because it, it, I, this came out of a search for tools to help us manage the complexity. We don't all have um, you know, satellites and, and radars and government agencies um, monitoring the health of our code. I, well, okay, the NSA probably is. So uh, if you have problem, questions about your, your scalability, you should give them a call. But um, they're not likely to offer up that information. Um, so the rest of this talk, I'm going to look at testability. We're all going to look at testability and get a sense for how it can help us. And hopefully, these will be non-obvious ways. I don't want you to leave this talk thinking, oh, that was, yeah, yeah, everybody knows that already, um, or it was uh, kind of naive and silly. Uh, I think there are some interesting um, and useful techniques, some useful and interesting points of view that you can leave with that will help you do your job. So I divided the talk up into three sections here. The first section I'm going to go over first is ground rules. I'm going to basically set up some definitions. Definitions that you may not ultimately agree with, but that I use throughout the rest of the talk. And so I'm just going to kind of try to lay the foundation for the, for the rest of the things I'm talking about. Uh, the bulk of this presentation will deal with uh, what I call qualities correlated with testability. This is grabbed a handful of software qualities and investigate how they interact with testability and how you might be able to use testability to work with those qualities to monitor them and to uh, control them, manage them. And finally, we'll spend some time looking at application of the principles that we go over in this talk. Basically, how you can use what, we're talk what I'm talking about in the real world, the, the real world, our jobs. So, first of all, what is a software architect? Uh, the, as many of you probably know, if you, you, know, you go to three software architects and ask them to define what a software architect is, you'll get four answers. It's um, not something we have a great answer for. Uh, and I think that's what conferences like this are kind of about. We, we need to figure this out. We need to come up with good definitions. Um, for this talk, though, I'm going to just kind of lay some groundwork, t tell you what I think is important, what I think um, is part of the role, and at least the parts of the role that are apropos to the rest of the things we're talking about. Job responsibilities of a software architect, I think we can all agree that the foundation of our profession is drawing boxes and arrows. And so, of course, you have to be able to do that to be a software architect. That was a joke. So. Um, well, you probably all do draw boxes and arrows at some point in your life. Um, I've gone over this managing non-functional requirements. I think this is sort of core to what practicing software architecture is today. In 50 years, maybe we'll look back and say, that's stupid, that's not right, but for now, that seems to be at the heart of a lot of what we call software architecture. It's the person who deals with the non-functional requirements, looks out for them, compromises them when necessary, is the engineer of non-functional requirements. This last bit, though, I think is really important and often overlooked. You must know how to code. Um, this is a somewhat glib way of saying you really need to be an expert developer if you're going to be an effective, practical software architect today. And uh, this comes from my own experience, from um, seeing who I think are good software architects, seeing the kind of work they ultimately do, and it's not based on any sort of theory of software architecture. Um, knowing how to code is also vital to applying a lot of what I'll talk about for the rest of this talk, which is why I put it in here, and I'll emphasize this several times. So a software architect, the important bits, manages non-functional requirements, must know how to code. And hopefully that'll make more sense in about 20 minutes. Another important thing that we need to define, obviously, is testability. What is testability? Like software architecture or software architect, testability doesn't have a great definition. Um, there's a sort of glib definition that, okay, software testability is how easy it is to test something or can something be tested. Uh, okay, that's true. It's kind of obviously true, but it's not, very, not a very helpful definition. Um, I can take any piece of software and declare it testable. Because if you give me some black box and say, if I put A in, I expect to get X out, I write a test that puts in A and gets out X. That is testable. But it's not a very useful definition, especially since we all, I think, would agree that there's a spectrum, 
of testability. There are some pieces of code that you've worked with in your life that you've written tests for, because you all write tests, right? Um, you said that was really easy. It was easy to think about, it was easy to set the tests up, it executes quickly, and you felt really confident in the test afterwards. Versus some things that you, you, you look at, you kind of scratch your set head and say, well, how do I test this? I have to instantiate all these things, I have to think about all these far-flung interactions, um, Maybe I don't really even know what it's supposed to do, and you end up just kind of you know, shotgunning tests at it in hope of getting good coverage, um, hope of finding all the edge cases, and, and you feel a little bit of unease when you ship it. You say, well, yeah, I think we tested it, but I'm not entirely sure. So this, this spectrum exists even if we can't fully define it, even if we can't put numbers on it. Some people will tell you you can put numbers on it, and perhaps we should be trying to. But again, from a practical point of view, I don't think there's any way to do that meaningfully. I can't tell you um, if one piece of code, I, I can't find some metric, some number that tells me this piece is more, more testable than this piece, or you know, just put actual definite numbers on it. There are a number of things that people more or less agree um, generally influence testability. And if you search on the internet and, and, and read books about testing and testability, you'll find lists like this. Um, you know, observability. Okay, that plays into testability because I can observe changes. Or understandability, that plays into a testability because if I can understand something, I can write a meaningful test for it. Um, this list is, is taken from Wikipedia if you want to, to find a full list. It's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty decent. But still, these are you know, almost as fuzzy as, as testability. You know, how observable is something? Well, I can't tell you that. Um, I can sort of wave my hands a bit. The big lesson... Um, or the big point I want to make from all of this talking about testability is that we don't have machines, we don't have automated ways to gauge testability. There are very few things, very few non-functional requirements that have really good metrics. Things like modularity to a degree do, because I can measure the dependence between modules. But there's not some you know, testability ometer that I can point at my code that will tell me, yeah, it's testable or it's testable to, you know, to this degree or something like that. So we don't have robots. You have to have a person. You have to have a software engineer. You have to have a software architect very often being responsible for understanding testability. And this is why I think it's, this is one of the big reasons I think it's important for software architects to know how to code. Because if you can't code, if you don't have deep experience with writing code and, and seeing how changes ripple through systems and things like that, excuse me, you'll have a great deal of trouble knowing if you're affecting the testability of the system. Or even, even gauging it at all. That, that, um, you, you have to be able to look at the code and say, okay, this looks testable. There's reasons why I think this is going to be hard to test or easy to test and so forth. Until we have better tools to help us with that, um, until we have robots to do it for us, then we are stuck doing it as humans. So I spent a fair amount of time just telling you now that testability is hard to define. Um, it takes a really skilled person to, to come to grips with. And so you might ask, well, why, why would you focus on testability? If I want to understand scalability in my system, why can't I just look at scalability? If I want to understand the modularity of my system, why can't I just look at the modularity? Um, and it's true, testability is difficult. Testability is, in some ways, it, it, you know, it's, it's the cure that's worse than the disease. You've taken one hard problem, replaced it with a harder problem. Um, perhaps you can uh, make that argument, and it's true to a degree. The fact is, though, testability is special. Testability occupies a privileged position in many software development processes, in many projects, in, in just the way many people approach. One way to see that is to recognize that testability is your first client. Tests are your first client. That you, you have an idea in your head, what you're supposed to code. You code it up. And maybe you've written your tests ahead of time if you're doing TDD, or maybe you write them afterwards. But that's the first other bit of code. That's the first thing that actually uses your code are your tests. So it's the first exercise of your code. And that's one thing that makes it special. Another is that your testing follows you through the entire length and breadth of your project. You're going to run your tests early. You're going to run your tests often. At least that's, that's, that's very common. Uh, and it's the you know, best practices that a lot of people espouse. So tests are, are a partner. They're sort of a privileged partner in the process, unlike many of, the other, um, many of the other qualities that you could try to focus on. You could try to focus on scalability specifically the whole time, but that's a, that's a new task almost. It's, a, it's almost a new job. But testability and testing happen almost automatically. They are built into how we do software for the past you know, 
10 years especially, it's become very, very much um, de rigueur. If you're paying attention, you'll notice that I made a subtle, um, a subtle but important semantic sort of shift in, my, in this slide. I was talking about testability and ended up talking about tests, actual tests. There's an argument to be made that I can have code that's perfectly testable, that is uh, some sense, you know, uh, the platonically testable in some sense, that has no actual tests. And that's true. Okay, sure. I, you can make that argument, and it's sort of, it, it's obviously true in and of itself, but it's kind of pointless. It's an academic argument, and so I want to, I feel it's an academic argument. Uh, why would you have testable code with no tests? Why would you go through the trouble? So I'm going to make an official amendment to the definition. Whatever definition of testability you had in your brain, for the purposes of this talk, assume that it also means tested, that you have written some number of tests, and probably sufficient tests to your, the, the tests that you judge are sufficient to assure the quality and assure the functionality of the code you're writing. So when I say testability, I mean tested, although not the reverse. If I say tested, it could be code that is monumentally difficult to test, and that's an important point. But testable code is tested for the rest of this talk. So that's, those are the ground rules. Um, hopefully they're not too uh, contentious. I don't think they're a big deal. I don't think that anybody's going like, to stand up and storm out of the room because I said that testable means tested. Um, but they do come back in some of these later sections. This next, next bit, um, quality is correlated with testabilities. Like I said, um, we're going to look at a handful of qualities, these five, uh, modularity, performance, scaling up development, by which I mean making your project bigger basically internally from an organizational point of view, uh, the solid principles, and modifiability. And we're going to look at those five and see how they intersect with testability and see how we can use testability as a a tool to help us um, keep on top of those, or how these influence testability. And there's a bit of a graph involved in how all these things are connected. So let's start with modularity. This is the cute picture. It's the low-hanging fruit picture. Modularity is, is it's really easy to see how modularity and testability relate. And when, um, uh, we'll, we'll make a list of this in a second, but modularity and testability kind of go hand in hand. Non-modular code is difficult to test and modular code is easier to test. So, and cute picture, so everybody's happy now. Um, what is modularity? Okay, a, a naive definition and a reasonably useful definition is breaking down software, but that doesn't really get to the heart of, of modularity, what we mean when we talk about the quality of modularity. You can take software and break it into horrible parts that don't make any sense, that you don't get any engineering benefit from. So there's reasons we break them down. Well, one reason we break them down is I want to reason about my modules in isolation. I want to be able to take module A and, and just scratch my head about it and understand its behavior independent of what other complex dependencies it might have. Hopefully those are minimal. But that's a big reason. This is one of the big criteria for why you would break something into modules or how you decide which modules to make. I also want to make modules that have minimal dependencies. We talk about uh, you know, high cohesion, low coupling. This is, this is the low coupling. I should be able to understand a module as independent as possible from anything that it might depend on. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Ultimately, I kind of like, like the DDRR, this design, develop, repair, replace. I want to be able to do this work, all of these things, to a module without having to worry too much about ripple over into other things. So this, this, is, this, is, this is a big reason for modularity because it allows me to design modules independently, develop them independently, repair them independently, replace them independently. There's probably other things I could add to that, but this just kind of flows well. So modularity is a bit like, um, I, I don't know if this phrase makes, uh, if it's across the ocean, but it, it's like mother and apple pie. It's, um, it's just good. Everybody agrees that it's good, and you don't really question that it's good. Um, and I tend to agree with that. Um, good developers are instinctively write modular code. They, they rebel you know, viscerally against code that, that has uh, cyclic dependencies and things like that. They instinctively want to develop modular code. So we want to foster modularity. We, it, it's, it's, it's a good thing. So the point of this talk, of course, is what does that have to do with testability? What does modularity and testability have to do with one another? And I said that um, 
they are mirrors in a sense. You got the fish looking at itself, ha ha. Um, so let's just look at a few, few ways that modularity and testability intersect, how they um, sort of cohabitate the same space. If I have modules, I'm blocking too much of the screen there, if I have modules that I independently instantiate, by which I mean I can, I can bring up class X without having to instantiate all the things that it might potentially use, that means that I can test it in isolation. And there's a lot of reasons that's good. Um, one is this is going to be faster. One is it's easier to write, another is it's easier to write tests. Another is that it's easier to write tests that I believe are correct, that are complete and have good coverage. With good modular code, I have fewer hidden dependencies, by which I mean this sort of snaking of, of behavior out from my module into other modules that it's non-obvious. Um, if I have hidden dependencies, then I might not be sure that when I, when I write a test for some module and I get back a negative result, can I be sure that that negative result is coming from the module that's actually under test? Or is it something, some obscure, you know, blip in some other module, you know, somebody forgot to, you know, decode their Unicode or something like that. I want to make sure that I have few hidden dependencies so that I know that when I'm writing my tests, that my tests are testing what I think they're testing. Say that 10 times fast. Finally, modular code is easier to understand, and I think this, this is overlooked, but um, it's overlooked a lot. Modular code is easier to understand. It's generally smaller, it's simpler, it's well-defined, and somebody has spent time reducing the coupling, and so they've spent time finding a subpart of the domain, so to speak. So if something's easier to understand, I can be sure that my testing, I can be more sure that my testing is very thorough. And this is important because it's easy to write, I have some piece of code and I, I, I want to test it, I can just kind of throw a few tests at it and say, okay, it looks good, but have no sense that I've actually fully covered all the edge cases, all the possible inputs, all the error conditions and so forth. But if something's easier to understand, it's easier to do thorough testing. It's easier to be sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Ultimately, though, this talk isn't supposed to be about how modularity makes my code more testable. It's supposed to be about how I can use testability, how, as an architect, I can monitor the testability of my system to tell me something about modularity. It's a pretty simple translation to take the equation we've kind of laid out and reverse it. If I'm writing tests and I find that it's easy to write my tests, if I don't find that I'm having to think too hard about it, I'm not having to stretch my mind out to all of the things that might fail in any part of my system, chances are your code is nice and modular. There's uh, an easy you know, translation of the modularity to testability into testability leads to modularity. So in this case, modularity is a gauge, it's a monitor. Sorry, I think I said that wrong. Testability is a gauge or a monitor for your modularity. It helps you keep tabs on it without specifically having to stare and think about modularity all the time. If I start having trouble writing my tests, if I find that it's difficult, if it's onerous, if I am unsure about the quality of my tests, or I find that I'm having to instantiate the world every time I want to run a single little unit test, that's a sign that maybe I should be looking at modularity. That's a good sign that I've messed something up and I have my dependencies flung far too wide. In the end, the lesson of this section is to listen to your tests. Okay, this is, this is good common sense in any event. But if you listen to your test, if you pay attention to the feedback you get from the process of writing your tests specifically, you can learn a lot of information and get a lot of insight into the modularity of your system. And this applies to other qualities, and we'll talk about some of those in a bit. But specifically modularity. Modularity is interesting in a lot of ways because it also feeds and supports other qualities. Modularity is sort of a basement quality, a foundational quality, excuse me, in many ways. And so, being able to understand and keep on top of your modularity is very, very important, which is why I put it first, because you guys won't have fallen asleep by now, I hope. Uh, this will sink in. The next quality I want to look at is performance. Um, obviously, performance isn't an illity, but it's still a, an, important, um, an important quality of our software. It's common to observe, common to say, that you can trade off performance for kind of anything else in a system. Um, if I've, you know, 
pushing to release and I, something's just not performant enough, well, maybe I can scale back the extensibility a bit and, and, and drop some you know, nicely designed, architected bit of code just to get a bit more speed out. And okay, this is kind of true. In fact, I'm going to say it is true. You can very often exchange one quality in your system to get a bit of performance. Um, it's not a great idea all the time, and we'll, we'll talk about why. I'm not suggesting that we trade off testability for performance. That can be done, but I think it's generally a bad idea. I think that you can trade off testability for performance, and that's a short-term game. It'll short-term gain. It'll feel really good uh, in the short term, and it, it has that same sense as what uh, Roy was talking about. That oh, you know, I, I did it once and, and it felt good, and things got faster. And so the next time you're approached with that same kind of dilemma, should I? trade X for performance, you might do it again and again and again. And all these little chips start to fall away from your beautiful architecture. And so I think, that's, I think it's a bad trade to make these short-term changes, uh, short-term exchanges, especially with testability. So what is the link then between testability and performance that we should be looking at? Um, you can make the argument, and it's true, that if I have fast code, then my tests will be faster, and then I'll run them more often, and so I'm getting more utility out of my tests. And that's, that's sort of obviously true. Yeah, I, I, if, if my tests take 20 minutes to run, I'm not likely to run them you know, after every compile. But if my tests take you know, 20 seconds to run, I'm very likely to do it all the time. That, I think, is a, it's good to keep in mind, but not that important um, relative to more important things. What you really want to keep in mind is the long-term uh, the long-term goals of your project, where you're going. This is where you want your project to be at the end when you deliver. If I focus too early in my project on performance, and I think a lot of people have this experience, you're early in a project and you see some bit of code that you see a clear optimization for it, and so you sit down and you write that optimization, and indeed that little bit of code runs nice and fast now. And maybe you're doing this with really great intentions. You think that by fixing this, you're, you're fixing performance in the long run. You're, you're, you're laying the groundwork for, for really good performance. But I, the experience I think a lot of us have is that that is just wrong. We are not smart enough in general to know that the change I'm making here actually has some meaningful impact on my code at the end of the project. I may make this little bit of code run 100 times faster, but if that code accounts for max, you know, one-tenth of one percent of the actual runtime of my system, all I've done is just wasted a bunch, a bunch of time. I've, you know, crushed this little thing with this, this giant ball. All this energy, all this developer time goes into crushing something that's insignificant. There's a um, quote by the, 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 the Flaming Lips, it's a great band. Um, they say, is it overwhelming to use a crane to crush a fly? And yes, that's, that's exactly this. It is overwhelming to do that. The problems you run into is you waste a lot of effort on incorrect focus. You spend a lot of time doing things that have really no impact. Yes, you may have made some small algorithm faster, and you feel good about yourself. Your computer science education is, is you know, dinging the bell and giving you the, the food pellet. But you, you've wasted your time. And that's valuable time, especially early in, early in a project when you should be trying to understand things like requirements. <laughs> Um, which is not understanding requirements is why we spend a lot of time, waste a lot of time on performance early on. More importantly though, at least for the purposes of this talk, is if you do these kinds of performance optimizations early, you tend to compromise other architectural qualities of your system. You tend to damage, in small ways, again this chipping away, you tend to damage the architectural qualities of your system that you should be trying to maintain. You want to keep Rather than spending all this time early on trying to make things fast before you really can fully appreciate and understand the ramifications and the, the characteristics of the performance of your system, you need to rather keep your testability high for the lifetime of the project, for as long as possible. By doing that, you make it possible to monitor and manage the compromises that you do have to make along the way. Testability gives you a lot of information about the little bits of damage and the, and, and the impacts of changes you make. And by damaging your testability early, 
and by damaging these qualities early, you sort of lose the dynamic range that that could give you. And that's, that's important, but as you can imagine, I've got a, an iceberg here, there's the bottom of the iceberg. What's, what's the more important thing? Why do I really want to keep testability high and good throughout the life of my project? So that when I get to the end, when I get to a point where I really do understand my performance needs, when I really do understand the performance characteristics and where I can get the most bang for the buck, where I can really start to use my profilers, basically, by having a highly testable system, I'm in a position at the, towards the end of my project to make the best performance changes, to make the ones that really matter, to take the 80% of your runtime and, and knock it in half, down to 40%, to make the real changes that are going to make your system do what it needs to do in a timely manner. This is hard. Um, it's hard to not make these small changes because you want those food pellets early in the project. You want to say, yeah, I made that faster. I made it you know, demonstrably better in, a, in some small way. So it's hard mentally to, keep, to stay rigorous enough, to stay disciplined enough, to keep your testability and your architecture sane enough so that by the time you get to the end, you can make these best performance changes. But it's crucial. Um, I've been on any number of projects where had we done this, we'd have had a better product, basically. Um, it's a hard lesson to learn, but an important one. So performance and modularity are kind of different ends of the, the design room, so to speak. Modularity is something that we as developers care about. It makes our jobs better and easier. Performance is something, okay, we care about it, but our customers really care about it. This is something that customers see and they experience and they really are concerned with. They probably don't care at all about modularity. So it's, it's inter interesting to think about these qualities in some sense in terms of who is concerned about them. Scaling up development, the next section, by, by, by which I mean making your, taking your project from being some you know, proof of concept or prototype and turning it into something larger, um, is in yet another position. Scaling up development is an organizational thing. This is something that your company wants to do. Your customers, okay, they kind of tangentially care about it. And as a developer, it's actually more annoying than anything. But okay, it's, it's a bit of a triangle here. And I wish I had drawn that triangle. I'm sorry I didn't. Um, what is the architect's role in scaling up development? Well, okay, architects are often in a position to be you know, the bridge, you know, another good metaphor, the bridge between development, between the technical end of a company and the business end of the company. I don't mean to shove them away. I mean, they're important, but marketing and, and, and strategy and, 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 and the, the sales force and things like that. The architect sits in an important position. He has to be able to listen to the business end of things, and he has to be able to tell the technical guys, what that means. He has to be able to map technology onto requirements. He has to know which requirements are more important or what the requirements even mean. Often, you know, there's this huge filter process to get requirements from one end down to the other in a way that's meaningful to everybody. That's a big part of the architect's job. Part of that job, then, is to make sure the software is in a position to be scaled up. That when the time comes to take something that might have been a pet project or a proof of concept or a skunk works thing and say, okay, this is good. The company wants this, the company can sell this. Let's make it big, let's, let's, let's make it official. Let's you know, make it a product we can ship. If, if, well, I'm, in, I'm in a company that ships actual things. I a lot of people are just making web, making web pages now. You're not so much shipping, um, but the point still applies. I'm in a very old company. So what are the stages this kind of goes through? What do you have to think about when you're when, 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 you, when you are considering how to make code scale up from small to big. You know, a project starts with maybe one person, maybe a small team. And that team might grow, um, or it might start about this size, but um, it grows just a little bit, just enough to kind of, you know, keep the ball rolling. But by the time they decide that they want to grow it into a product, they want to make it big and official, you start to face all sorts of other problems. You get multiple teams. Uh, it may just not be multiple teams in the same building. This could be different buildings, different cities, different continents. And this adds a whole host of complexities that you may not have thought about when you were doing your little proof of concept work. You may get things like official testing departments now. It's not just you running your unit tests and your integration tests on your, your Jenkins server or whatever. Now you've got a team somewhere, a testing department, and they have their own requirements, their own needs, and their own systems, their own infrastructure. You may get things like acceptance tests. I should have labeled that, but that's an acceptance test uh, set of check, check boxes over there. Um, Something you may not have thought about because you really hadn't thought about the bigger world. You hadn't thought about all the uh, you know, integration you might have to do. 
and you may get things like documentation teams. I mean, you can grow this, of course, as big as you want. All sorts of stuff starts to come into play. Marketing people, salespeople. Um, the point is there are lots of new elements that if you're not ready for, if you haven't planned for, and I'm arguing it's the architect's job to make sure this happens, if you haven't planned for it, you're going to have a really difficult time growing your code to the point where you may have to scrap it and start over again, which is sometimes a really, it's the reasonable thing to do. But it's nice and better in many ways if you can take what you started with and make it grow gracefully into the organization. It's less jarring. It's less scary to, um, to management, frankly. If somebody comes to you and says, we'd like to grow your product into, or like to grow your little project into a product, and you say, okay, well, we're going to have to rewrite it. That's a good way to have them say, well, no, we really don't want to do that anymore. Um, so if you can tell them, yes, we have a plan for that. We have a glide path, so to speak, to get it to be productized. They'll be much more inclined to take your project and make it into something big, in my experience. So what do you have to do? What does testability tell you about all of this stuff? How does testability help you, to get back to the point of the talk, to how does testability help you make sure that your code can scale up to production levels? Well, we've talked about how testability helps you keep your code modular and the relationship between modularity and, and testability. If I've got modular code, I'm much more able to have independent development teams. I can take this part, this part, and this part and ship them off to different teams, and they can make good progress immediately. If I've got a good set of tests, and this comes back to this notion that testable means tested, if I have a good set of tests, a quality set of tests that, that is has, with, to a high degree of confidence tells me if I've broken things, the new developers who are not experts in your project, they've just been brought in from somewhere, hopefully, you know, who knows where they're coming from, but hopefully they're smart enough people, but they can develop with confidence. If they don't have a test suite, if all they've got is sort of manually messing around with the product or, or messing with the API or something like that, they're going to be a lot less, a lot more reticent, a lot less um, confident in being able to make changes, and so you're going to have much slower progress. They're going to end up calling you, the original guy, all the time going, what happens if I do this? What, is this, what does this exception mean? Um, if I want to make this change, what files do I have to touch? But if you tell them, look, we've got a great big unit, uh, unit test suite and uh, integration suite, whatever you've got, if you run that and things pass, you're in really good shape. That is a big leg up. That's a big advantage when you're in this kind of position. Finally, if you've got good tests, it's often easier to inter in integrate with, for instance, the test team that I introduced in the, the diagram a bit way back. You know, they're going to have their own way of doing things, their own procedures and stuff. But if I can tell them, look, here are our tests. They're well-defined. They are good tests and that they cover everything we do. Try to use these directly. That's great for them. It's a lot less work for them. And it means that they don't have to spend as much time, frankly, with you. They can, you, can, you can hand the code to them, they can integrate it into their system, and they'll be happy and they'll move on. It's a lot less time for you to explain to them how to do it. It's a lot less time for them scratching their heads and getting things wrong a lot of the time. Not to say that testers are going to get things wrong on purpose or that they're incompetent, but it's difficult. Like I said, every part of software development is hard. That's scaling up development. Solid um, is not what we would classically call a, uh, a non-functional requirement, so to speak. It's almost a, I don't even know the best words for it. It's, it's, it's an approach to writing, it's, it's a set of uh, guidelines for writing object-oriented code. So if you don't write OO code, you can, you can take a nap through, through this section. Um, SOLID is an acronym for single responsibility, open close, Liskov substitution, interface segregation, and dependency inversion. And each of these has some interplay with testability. Each of these touches in testability in, in some interesting way. And I thought I would um, include this in the talk because it's something that uh, a lot of people do. A lot of people do solid. They, they you know, have a little checklist almost when they look at a new piece of code. They say, is it solid? Or am I missing some, violating some principle? And that's good. These are really useful, um, really useful principles if you're writing object-oriented code. So, Single responsibility, summing it up in a single sentence, do one thing and do it well. This is what single responsibility means. Um, there's really no simpler way to put it, really no better way to put it. If you've got some piece of code, some class, don't have it doing 10 things, have it doing one thing. You've almost certainly all seen a class like this. You've got some big Java or C++ or C Sharp um, framework 
or some big body of code. And you've got this uber base class that has a render function, that has a serialize function. And these are all virtual functions in C++, let's say. And activate, and children, and is alive, and dealloc, and kill, and, and ensure active if visible. And you wonder, like, where do these come from? Why are they all in the same place? They, they obviously don't all belong there. This is just um, this is a sign of age. But it's a clear sign that single responsibility has been violated. A class that has to do all of this at once has a bunch of responsibilities. Very often, you end up with a whole bunch of subclasses of component object, which I just made up. It's, it's supposed to be a generic, sort of a, <laughs> a meaningless name, almost. You end up with the compound component object, which somehow combines other component objects, or the main view, which is not a compound CO, or the storage manager, which is clearly not a view, but has to support that interface for some reason. Um, again, because the code is old. Somebody got lazy at some point, and they let their architecture get away from them. This interacts with tests in so many ways, but I've listed three. How many tests do I need to write to test a subclass of that? Well, apparently I need to test all that stuff because they're going to have concrete implementations of all of that stuff. How do I even know what it's supposed to do? What happens if I activate something that's been dealloced? I don't know. Does it, does, and does, does it depend on, the, on the, uh, the concrete class or is, there some, is that a built-in behavior? It's really hard to say. And, and of course, that's, that's, that just comes down to interactions. What do all these things have to do with one another? I can't reason about any of these subclasses without reasoning about, about asking all of these questions. And I have to answer these questions to write tests. I have to answer these questions to write tests that I trust, tests that fully cover the, the, the code. So I think that's, that's the obvious way that testing and, and solid interact. Um, there may be better ways to um, realize what component object is doing. You could sort of break it up into you know, displayable, serializable, activatable, kind of break those things up. Maybe that's a step in the right direction. Still, this is a pretty awful picture here. There's no way that these guys are actually siblings. They shouldn't be. So there's, there's deeper problems in this code. But this is one way to try to approach, um, approach making this singly responsible, making the subclasses conform to the principle of single responsibility. The next solid principle is open-closed. Um, open for extension, closed for modification. Um, the point of open-closed, and, and, and I'm laying some, I'm, I'm giving these definitions because I assume not everybody knows uh, solid, uh, but open for extension means that I should be able to extend a class, I should be able to, or, I'm not, I don't want to say class, but I guess this is OO, so I want to be able to extend a class, I want to be able to add functionality to a class, but I don't want to have to open up that class and, and mess with its internals to make that work. And this is um, easy to say, hard to do in practice, because it often seems to imply a lot of extra work. But let's look at a, um, an example. This is code that I stole from my business partner um, in the back of the room, so thanks, Rob. Um, on this side, you've got code that is closed. Uh, yeah, it's, um, well, it has to be opened up to be extended. If I want to add a new type of um, swallow, I have to come in here, I have to open up, get speed, I have to add in a new case. And the alternative is that I have this open closed uh, compliant framework here, a framework uh, class hierarchy, bird, and then all of these guys at the bottom. And these numbers, in case you're wondering, this, the, these numbers come from uh, a study in uh, complexity in uh, cyclomatic complexity. So this is the cyclomatic complexity of that function. This is the cyclomatic complexity of this. Three is less than seven. It's less complex, at least by one measure. What does that have to do with testability? What it has to do with testability, and this is, an, this is a great quote, so I just threw it in here. It's not entirely necessary, but how many if statements does it take to add a feature? That's, that's in some sense what open close is all about. If you can answer that question um, and say zero, you've got a nice open close compliant bit of code. And if you have to add a lot of if statements, you've made extension really difficult. What this has to do with testability has to do with ripple through your tests. If I, in writing tests, I very often have to do things like make mock classes. I have to fake bits of the real system to make my tests work. 
if I find that I make a small change to my source code and that ripples all through my tests and I have to change a bunch of tests, there's a good chance that you violated open closed. Or if to add these mock classes, I have to go and actually modify the source that I'm testing to make them amenable to test, that's a really good sign that you violated open closed. So it's good to keep in mind, when you're writing your test, I, I keep harping on this, I think, but pay attention to what it's like to write your tests. Pay attention to the feedback you're getting from the testing process and the test development process. And you can start to see specific problems in, tes in testing, specific problems in the experience of writing tests point to specific problems in how you're developing your code and how you structured your code. It's a really pretty picture, too, so it's a nice slide. The next uh, quality we'll look at is list cost substitution. This is um, bread and butter. Uh, there's no easy way to say it. This is the best I can come up with. Replacing base with derived preserves behavior. So if I've got a bit of code that works against a base class, I should be able to use any derived class in that situation and have the code still work. This is embodying the distinction between interfaces and protocols or interfaces and semantics. We have plenty of tools called compilers that help us make sure our interfaces all you know, talk, the plumbing is there. But we have very few tools, none that are particularly useful, to help us make sure that the behavior of what's going on behind those interfaces is doing the right thing. Liskov substitution is a rule to keep in mind to help you um, be compliant, to make sure that you are doing the right thing when you write a subclass. A way to look at that with respect to testability is I've got some base class, some subclass A, and I write a test that uses base class, except expects some kind of base class, and if I pass in a subclass A to that test, I get a pass. If I have messed up my Liskov substitution, and I create, that's supposed to say subclass B, um, and subclass B is then passed in the test and it fails, that means that I have screwed up the behavior. It means that I have written a test that is supposed to work for any base class, doesn't work for subclass A, so there's a behavioral difference between the two. So you can use your tests to tell you, in the specific kind of case, when you violated this class substitution. Easy rule, fairly obvious. The second to last, interface segregation, is um, hard to put into small words, but prefer cohesive focused interfaces. Uh, the, the longer form of this is that no code should be getting interfaces that it doesn't need. That it, you, should, you, should, you should have dependency on all the interfaces you get. And if I get a great big interface that has a lot of stuff that I don't care about in my function, then I'm receiving the wrong interface and I need to segregate my interfaces a bit more. Following this principle makes it easier to get testing right, basically. This is related to this problem a while back with this component object. This is not a very well segregated interface. There's a lot I have to think about to get it right. Sorry, this is. And a bit more. And you can see this if I've got this uh, sort of mythical kitchen sink class that my class depends on. Uh, kitchen sink may be an idiom that hasn't crossed the ocean either, but basically it's a class that kind of does all sorts of stuff. It's an interface that covers too much. Um, it's hard to write tests. It's hard to mock kitchen sink, which is a, a common activity. If, if I've got, I'm trying to test my class, my class depends on a kitchen sink and I want to write a mock because kitchen sink does way too much. If I have to mock the full kitchen sink, that's a lot of work, it's tedious, it's hard to get right, frankly, so you end up testing your tests. And there's a whole just extra boatload of work that you have to do to make this something meaningful and something useful. It's a lot of work. You're better off, of course, if you're following interface segregation, having my class depend on some much smaller interface. And so if you find that you're having to write huge mocks and they're a bunch of work and they feel like meaningless work, you feel like you're just kind of making a bunch of pass through and void functions, then chances are you've got some interfaces that need to be broken up. So another powerful signal coming out of your testing system, out of your testing efforts. The final solid principle we'll look at is dependency inversion. And dependency inversion in small words is depend only on abstractions and low depends on high. So uh, one way to look at this is, uh, well, we'll actually look at pictures. 
this is a small bit of code that needs some dependency inversion. And I used some kind of hyperbolic classes here to make that clear. I want to send a message. Um, I want to send this message, and I want to send it through, well, in this case, I'm forced to send it through a satellite uplink, which you can imagine is probably an expensive class to instantiate because you have to fire up your antenna array and send a message into space. Better would be this simple reconstruction, this simple uh, re-envisioning of it, where I send in the relay, and satellite uplink is one version of that, and my mock relay depends on that relay. So clearly, dependency inversion allows you to more easily write mocks, and I keep coming back to that. Mocks are sort of popular right now, so it was easy to uh, insert those into the talk. If I can't mock things, if I am forced to use satellite uplink, my tests are probably going to take a long time to run. I can't be sure that actually I'm testing what I want to test, because this test is now not just testing this function, it's testing the constructor for satellite uplink and <laughs> whether or not satellite uplink can send a message into space. That's a lot of extra stuff to test, and there's a lot of things in there that can fail that have nothing to do with whether this function actually operates correctly given an arbitrary relay. So, Dependency inversion allows you to write the tests you want to write, the tests you need to write, small focus tests that tell you exactly what you want to find out. Those are the solid principles. Um, kind of go through those quickly. They're, they're worth investigating if you do OO code, O development, and you've never heard of them, you definitely should look into them. They're useful rules of thumb, and I hope I've demonstrated at least that they have a significant impact on or a significant intersection with, with testability. The overall message to take away from this section is that solid code is testable code. If you follow the solid principles, you have code that is much easier to test in general, as a rule. Conversely, testable code is probably solid. This is similar to the modularity argument I made. If writing my code is easy, if writing my tests is easy, chances are my code is modular and solid. And they're kind of actually kind of the same thing in many ways. So that's solid. The final quality I want to look at is modifiability. That's a Mr. Potato Head. Mr. Potato Head is incredibly modifiable. I thought he would be good for this. You can take the ears and stick them where you want and take the hat off and take the feet off and all that kind of stuff. What is modifiability? It, it's this another one of these qualities that it's a bit hard to define in some rigorous you know, mathematical engineering way. But it's a, it's a measure of how easy it is to modify a piece of code. And specifically, it's a measure of how quickly I can make modifications that are safe. I can quickly make all sorts of modifications to my code that just break everything, so that's not modifiability. Um, it's the ability to make the changes you want to make, the right changes, and do it in a controlled manner, and to know when you've broken things. It's room for experimentation is really what, what it comes down to. One, one way that uh, modifiability plays into the other qualities you've looked at is, well, I've got modular code, I have reduced coupling, and so I have low ripple. So modular code is modifiable to a much higher degree than non-modular code because if I don't have modular code, I make one bit of change to one bit of my code, and that can spread out. That can have de de dependency effects all over the rest of my code. Meaning that to make that small change, I have to take a lot more into account. But if I have nice modular code, well, then I have a much lower ripple effect through the rest of my code. Since testability helps me with modularity, testability plays a lot into modifiability. It's a bit of the same argument that you could make that we made for performance. By having a testable system, I've guaranteed that I've kept my system healthy enough to have performance or to have modifiability throughout the lifetime of the project. Likewise, if I've got solid code, so to speak. Uh, it's a great acronym because it sounds positive when you say it. My code is often easier to understand because it follows really well-known, established, good principles, and therefore simpler to modify. I can, if I can understand what my code is supposed to do, and I can understand the relationships, and I can understand how a change here is going to affect or not affect all the other parts, it's easier for me to reason about the changes and to think about alternatives and to pick the best, the best change I could possibly make. So, strong tests allow you to make changes safely. I've said that a couple times. Importantly, it allows you to make riskier changes and to make faster changes. And that's, okay, this sounds maybe a bit cavalier, you know, a bit, um, 
what's the word they were using eight years ago, um, going rogue, you know, you, why do you want to make risky changes? Well, sometimes a risky change is the best change to make. If you reach a point in your development and you're at the end and you're saying, well, I've got to make this, this change, but um, I don't know if I can safely make it. I'll just make something that's a bit safer but not quite as good. Well, then you're, you're being hemmed in by your lack of modifiability. And if you, but if you use testability throughout the lifetime of your code to make sure that you've maintained modifiability, by the time you get to the end of your project, you can make the most important changes. This relates back to the performance argument again, where I said by, when you get to the end of your project, that's when you can know the best performance changes to make. That's when you have the most important knowledge. And that is the flip side of this coin. It's just another way of looking at this exact same statement. Test testability allows you to make the best changes in your code at the right times. Right, we're doing good on time. So that's it for the qualities correlated to testability. So you can stretch out a little bit and uh, you know, stretch your neck a little bit. Um, this last section, application, is simple ways really that the principles I've talked about up to now apply to the real world and to some common development methods and development approaches. We'll look at a handful. Um, one, we'll look at being involved in the code. That architect needs to be involved in the code. We'll look at uh, how, how these principles apply to agile methods, test-driven design, domain-driven design, and greenfield versus brownfield development. And then we'll close up. This goes back, this, this need to be involved in the code as an architect it goes back to my arguments earlier that an architect has to be an expert developer. In this day and age, for practical purposes, that's what an architect needs to be. It's, it has to be on their tool belt. An architect, on the projects he's working on, he needs to be able to monitor, he needs to be able to, to, to at least view the changes and understand the changes that are happening at the code level because that's where these little erosions happen. If, if, if you allow a bunch of little, um, what I call compromises, into the code over time, you have a bunch of, you have bigger compromises. An architect who can't look at code, an architect who can't quickly look at code and understand how that's going to affect, how these small changes are going to affect the testability of a system or the other software qualities, is at such a tremendous disadvantage that I would argue that he really can't do his job effectively, his or her job. I'm PC about this. Um, changes are ultimately all introduced at the code level. Um, this is not to say that a software architect needs to be somehow looking at every line of code that's uh, submitted. Uh, that's just it's wildly impractical for the most part. I mean, you go back to the, the, the Space Marine slides, you had this guy, you had uh, multiple large, fast-moving projects. There's no way you can meaningfully look at every line of change. Well, you can be involved in writing code sometimes, which I think is important, and people like Simon Brown would argue that, that you should be. Um, you can be involved in code reviews. There's lots of great tools. This is, this is, this is Garrett, uh, as I, yeah, this is Garrett. Um, they allow you to quickly to see what people are doing. And actually, you know, this kind of high level is, is a great way to keep a sense of, of all the changes that are happening, even in large projects. Uh, if you can't do this, well, you should be able to do this. If you can't do this, talk to your boss, tell him you want to be able to do this. You can also be involved in design, the low, lower level designs, and you might normally associate with the work of an architect. You should be involved in unit level designs when possible, just to keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on. With that said, if you're involved at the code at the review level and the low-level design level, but you're not a really good strong, you're not a strong coder, you're going to have trouble understanding you know, what does this change mean in terms of extensibility or testability to stick with the, the uh, theme of this talk. If you don't know code and you can't think outside you just the, the, the actual textual changes, you're going to have problems assessing that. So you need to be a good coder to be able to apply it's a testability metric to code. It's, uh, again, no robots can help you. This is a person's job. The intersection of testability with, with Agile is, um, I think, quite straightforward, um, although I maybe underappreciated. Uh, just as a quick primer, I mean, I'm not concerned about any particular Agile method. I know there are people who are deeply concerned about using the right one. Most of them, maybe all of them, do depend basically on feedback. That's, that's at the core of, of an agile method is that I have maybe you know, my, 
my big sprint level uh, planning review feedback systems and I have my stand-ups and I have my individual developer and maybe there's something smaller than that and something bigger than that. It's this fractal notion of feedback at all times. And so Agile is really dependent on signals that it gets in this feedback loop. For it to work right and to be the most effective, you want to make sure you're getting the best signals, the most meaningful signals in these cycles. And I think it's easy to see that testability can be and generally is a strong signal in these feedback loops. But it's one that I think that we don't explicitly um, pay attention to. Maybe I'm wrong, but in my experience, we're much more, in, much more concerned with um, just other things, things that are more apparent. We just don't pay enough attention to testability in general, and so it doesn't make, it, make itself, it doesn't make its way into these feedback loops. We don't talk about it. Um, maybe testability in your, your agile um, setup doesn't become this kind of first level entity, this thing you talk about in stand-ups. But if it becomes something that you pay attention to as an individual developer or as an architect looking at what's going on inside the, the, the sprints, the fallout of paying attention to testability can improve the signal that you're getting from the other things you're looking at. You know, how's my performance doing? How extensible does the system feel? Et cetera, et cetera. It's important to maintain testability through the lifetime of the system for another reason. Um, this is that same slide I showed earlier. You want to start here, which is North Seas over there, and you want to get to there, which is actually a beautiful little town called Lisa Bolton. Um, that's how long your code needs to stay agile. And I want to draw a distinction between teams being agile. You could have the most agile, self-organizing uh, super team in the world, but if your code can't accept the modifications that you want to make to it, it doesn't matter how agile you are because you, you can't make the changes you need to make, and so you're basically stuck with what you've got. If you, can, if you can maintain a high level of testability through the lifetime of your project, you maintain high modifiability. And that means that you can do whatever you want along this entire path, from the very beginning of the project to the very end of the project. And that's important. That red line, how long you need to stay agile, not just you, your team, but the code that you're writing. Test-driven design. Um, we saw Steve Freeman give a talk on TDD last night. Um, and he drew this exact same picture because this picture is straight out of the book they wrote on TDD. Um, fundamentally, TDD is you start here, when you write a failing test, you make the test pass, and then you refactor, and that's the cycle you follow forever and ever and ever. And that's true. I mean, there are various flavors of TDD, much like there are various flavors of Agile, but they all sort of involve this mindset. You write the tests first, everything follows from that. In the book, in the uh, Growing Object-Oriented Software book that, that, that he co-wrote, the more important picture to me, the one that really resonated, was the original picture with this extra line added. You're writing your tests, you're doing some work on your tests, and you realize, I need to refactor. This is listening to your testability. This is listening to the testability of your system. You can't see what I'm pointing at, sorry, this, this line. If you are writing a test and you realize you're having trouble doing it, then you follow this edge back to refactor, and that is applying a lot of the principles that I've talked about so far. So the, the interaction between TDD and testability is, um, I mean, it's pretty self-apparent. This is, this is the book. If you haven't read it, um, I highly recommend it. And I think that Steve is speaking here, isn't he? Yeah, um, and maybe Nat. Um, on some level, the, 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 the principles I'm talking about here are implicit in, in TDD. You get them for free because you're focusing on tests from the very beginning. They are the source, the, um, the, the wellspring from which all of their development takes place. So the benefits are, are built in. But that doesn't mean that you can't pay more attention to testability as a sort of first-class citizen, as a, as a first-class concern. If you want to explicitly apply these principles in your TDD efforts, well, you're in a really great position to do so, obviously, because you are already organizationally focused on tests. And that refactoring loop, that extra line, is this refactoring loop. That's, that's where you will be looking at tests, scratching your head about why you're having trouble writing tests, and use that as a determining factor to go and do refactoring, not adding new features. So 
TDD strength is based upon a lot of the same ideas uh, that I'm talking about here. They are, they're buddies, really. They're, they're coming from the same source in a lot of ways. And I hope I'm not mis misrepresenting TDD, because we'll, I'll find out if I am. Um, Domain-driven design, another DD. Um, there it is, okay, everybody memorize that. Um, Domain-driven design really is, is centering your activities, centering a great deal of your development activities around a core model of the domain. Um, the DDD is focused on identifying that domain, describing it, codifying it, and modeling it, and building it so that you can build the rest of your software around it. Um, it comes from, from well, initially it comes from this book, um, well worth reading, and this is a quick primer that I think you can get for free on the internet. Uh, definitely check it out if you don't know anything about DDD. How DDD intersects with testability is, well, there's one really obvious way. A domain model in DDD is a highly testable thing. It is, by definition, independent of all the other things that your software is doing, all the other systems that might be connecting to it. It is, by definition, independent of those. Um, the domain model in this image might be everything kind of inside, you know, inside there. And you've got all this other stuff impinging upon it, but it never gets to, in, in the, the, the out, external dependencies never make their way in. So the domain model can always be pulled out, always be looked at independently, and always be reasoned about independently. So it's highly testable pretty much by design. And we can start to ask questions then. Um, is my... To, to relate this back to the earlier qualities we examined in this talk, at least, um, is my domain model modular? Well, it, it is a module. Internally, it can be a bit of a mess, although the DDD texts will help you make sure that your domain model is internally very solid as well. So yes, it's modular, at least insofar as externally it is uh, independent of the rest of the world. Is it performant? Maybe. Uh, that's hard to say. Does it scale up? Yes, it's, it does, does the development of software around a domain model scale up organizationally? Yes, it does very well. This is one of the key things that you'll find with, with uh, DDD, is that you can take that domain model and say, tell another team, start working against it. And if you follow the, the rules of DDD, other teams will have no problem developing against it, and they won't be stepping on each other's toes because the domain model is self-contained, self-constraining, um, not really self-describing, but easily described, well-designed. Is it modifiable? Well, yes, it's modifiable by, by dint of the fact that it's, uh, it's low dependencies and it's well understood and you spend a lot of time thinking about it ahead of time. You, you, you talk to domain experts and then you get feedback from, from customers and all these kinds of things are supposed to go into the domain model. So any changes you make need to be springing from those, um, those kinds of sources. So it's, and, and the way that DDD forces you to structure your code internally makes it highly modifiable as well. Is it solid? Who knows? Probably. Um, it's like performance. It may or may not be. It depends on how you code. My main point, though, is that testability and DDD um, kind of go hand in hand. Uh, domain models are easy to test. And all of these qualities you get, you know, if, I focus on modular, if I focus on testability and my domain model is highly testable, that's likely to give me modular code, scaled code, modifiable code. These are all really good reasons to try DDD. I'm basically um, cheering DDD on. I like it. It's, I think it's a really powerful technique, and if you haven't looked into it, um, please do. The last sort of real-world application um, is how does testability intersect with sort of greenfield versus brownfield development? Um, greenfield development, uh, you can apply the principles I've talked about, the testability focus and all that, from the get-go, and I hope you do if you're in the position to do this kind of work, which is relatively rare. Most people actually are coming to development on a sort of brownfield project where there's a lot of stuff that already exists. Um, you may be coming into a situation where tests already exist. Uh, that's great, this is a really good position to be in. It means that you can start to develop with confidence. This goes back on some level to the earlier discussions about how to scale up a project. If there's good tests in place, yeah, you can move ahead and you can continue to apply these testability principles. Of course, you may get a project that uh, has a lot of tests, but still has really bad testability. All the tests are complicated, heavyweight, difficult. Um, you can look at these tests 
and use those as guides to say, okay, this test, is, this test is really big and it's complicated and I don't understand it. What would make it easier to understand? Let's dissect it a bit. And by dissecting it, you get a feel for the testability and then you get a feel for what needs to change in the code if you have the leeway to do so. Of course, a very common situation, unfortunately, is that we have you know, no tests or, or few tests on the, uh, the projects we're starting up. And that's, this is a difficult position to be in no matter how you slice it or dice it. And I'm not gonna say that testability is going to save you. Um, except once you start getting tests in place, well then you can start to apply these principles. If you're in a position like this of no tests or few tests, I suggest that you go and read this book. Um, it's an incredibly good book, one of the most important books that I've read uh, with regard to my professional life in a long time. Um, I think it's a really well done, readable, and you know, powerful book. I think there's also a talk later in the conference by um, Richard Blewett on introducing unit testing to legacy code, that's exactly this. I mean, legacy code and getting some tests into it is vitally important, especially if you want to apply the principles I've talked about. We're nearly done. Um, in a good time, too. So, to end this, I want to invoke more influential names than mine. You probably don't know who I am, um, but most of these names that I'm going to show in a second are names you're probably familiar with. They are smart people. Maybe smarter than me, doesn't matter, they're more well known than me, so I'm just gonna use them for my own ends. What does Uncle Bob Martin have to say? One reasonable definition of good design is testability. It's hard to imagine a software system that is both testable and poorly designed. It's also hard to imagine a software system that is well designed but also untestable. John Lacos. Design for testability is of paramount importance when successfully constructing large and very large C++ systems. Michael Feathers. There appears to be a synergy between testability at the unit level and good design. If you aim for testability and make some good choices, design gets better. If you aim for good design, your design becomes more testable. That's all I've got, and I'll be happy to take questions. All right. Thank you. <laughs>